Story ten of Wounds in the Rain War Stories by Stephen Crane. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Story ten War Memories Part two. Later I fell into the hands of one of my closest friends, and he mercilessly outlined a scheme for landing to the west of Santiago and getting through the Spanish lines to some place from which we could view the Spanish squadron lying in the harbour. There was rumour that the Vizcaya had escaped, he said, and it would be very nice to make sure of the truth. So we steamed to a point opposite a Cuban camp, which my friend knew, and flung two crop-tailed Jamaica polo ponies into the sea. We followed in a small boat, and were met on the beach by a small Cuban detachment, who immediately caught our ponies and saddled them for us. I suppose we felt rather godlike. We were almost the first Americans they had seen, and they looked at us with eyes of grateful affection. I don't suppose many men have the experience of being looked at with the eyes of grateful affection. They guide us to a Cuban camp, where, in a little palm-bark hut, a black-faced lieutenant colonel was lolling in a hammock. I couldn't understand what was said, but at any rate he must have ordered his half-naked orderly to make coffee, for it was done. It was a dark syrup in smoky tin cups, but it was better than the cold bottle of beer which I did not drink in Jamaica. The Cuban camp was an expeditious affair of saplings and palm-bark, tied with creepers. It could be burned to the ground in fifteen minutes, and in ten reduplicated. The soldiers were in appearance an absolutely good-natured set of half-starred ragamuffins. Their breeches hung in threads about their black legs, and their shirts were as nothing. They looked like a collection of real tropic savages, at whom some philanthropist had flung a bundle of rags, and some of the rags had stuck here and there. But their condition was now a habit. I doubt if they knew they were half-naked. Anyhow, they didn't care. No more they should. The weather was warm. This lieutenant colonel gave us an escort of five or six men, and we went up into the mountains, lying flat on our Jamaica ponies, while they went like rats up and down extraordinary trails. In the evening we reached the camp of a major who commanded the outposts. It was high, high in the hills. The stars were as big as coconuts. We lay in borrowed hammocks, and watched the firelight gleam blood-red on the trees. I remember an utterly naked negro squatting, crimson, by the fire, and cleaning an iron pot. Some voices were singing an Afric wail of forsaken love and death, and at dawn we were to try to steal through the Spanish lines. I was very, very sorry. In the cold dawn the situation was the same, but somehow courage seemed to be in the breaking day. I went off with the others quite cheerfully. We came to where the pickets stood behind the bulwarks of stone in frameworks of saplings. They were peering across a narrow cloud-steeped gulch at a dull fire marking a Spanish post. There was some palaver, and then, with fifteen men, we descended the side of this mountain, going down into the chill blue and grey clouds. We had left our horses with the Cuban pickets. We proceeded stealthily, for we were already within range of the Spanish pickets. At the bottom of the canyon it was still night. A brook, a regular salmon stream, brawled over the rocks. There were grassy banks and most delightful trees. The whole valley was a sylvan fragrance. But the guide waved his arm and scowled warningly, and in a moment we were off, threading thickets, climbing hills, crawling through fields on our hands and knees, sometimes sweeping like seventeen phantoms across a Spanish road. I was in a dream, but I kept my eye on the guide, and halted to listen when he halted to listen, and ambled onward when he ambled onward. Sometimes he turned and pantomimed as ably and fiercely as a man being stung by a thousand hornets. Then we knew that the situation was extremely delicate. We were now, of course, well inside the Spanish lines, and we ascended a great hill which overlooked the harbour of Santiago. 
There, tranquilly at anchor, lay the Oquendo, the Maria Theresa, the Cristobal Colon, the Vizcaya, the Bouton, the Furor. The bay was white in the sun, and the great black-tall armoured cruisers were impressive in a dignity massive yet graceful. We did not know that they were all doomed ships, soon to go out to a swift death. My friend drew maps and things, while I devoted myself to complete rest, blinking lazily at the Spanish squadron. We did not know that we were the last Americans to view them alive, and unhurt, and at peace. Then we retraced our way, at the same noiseless canter. I did not understand my condition until I considered that we were well through the Spanish lines and practically out of danger. Then I discovered that I was a dead man. The nervous force having evaporated, I was a mere corpse. My limbs were of dough, and my spinal cord burned within me as if it were red-hot wire. But just at this time we were discovered by a Spanish patrol, and I ascertained that I was not dead at all. We ultimately reached the foot of the Mother Mountain, on whose shoulders were the Cuban pickets, and here I was so sure of safety that I could not resist the temptation to die again. I think I passed into eleven distinct stupors during the ascent of that mountain, while the escort stood leaning on their Remingtons. We had done twenty-five miles at a sort of a man-gallop, never once using a beaten track, but always going promiscuously through the jungle and over the rocks. And many of the miles stood straight on end, so that it was as hard to come down as it was to go up. But during my stupors the escort stood, mind you, and chatted in low voices. For all the signs they showed, we might have been starting and they had had nothing to eat but mangoes for over eight days. Previous to the eight days they had been living on mangoes and the carcass of a small lean pony. They were, in fact, of the stuff of Fenimore Cooper's Indians, only they made no preposterous orations. At the Major's camp my friend and I agreed that if our worthy escort would send down a representative with us to the coast, we would send back to them whatever we could spare from the stores of our dispatch boat. With one voice the escort answered that they themselves would go the additional four leagues, as in these starving times they did not care to trust a representative. Thank you. They can't do it. They'll peg out. There must be a limit, I said. Uh, no, answered my friend, they're all right. They'd run three times around the whole island for a mouthful of beer. So we saddled up and put off with our fifteen Cuban infantrymen wagging along tirelessly behind us. Sometimes, at the foot of a precipitous hill, a man asked permission to cling to my horse's tail, and then the Jamaican pony would snake him to the summit so swiftly that only his toes seemed to touch the rocks and for this assistance the man was grateful. When we crowned the last great ridge, we saw our squadron to the eastward spread in its patient semicircular about the mouth of the harbour. But as we wound towards the beach, we saw a more dramatic thing, our own dispatch boat leaving the rendezvous and putting off to sea. Evidently we were late. Behind me were fifteen stomachs, empty. It was a frightful situation. My friend and I charged for the beach, and those fifteen fools began to run. It was no use. The dispatch boat went gaily away, trailing black smoke behind her. We turned in distress, wondering what we could say to that abused escort. If they massacred us, I felt that it would be merely a virtuous reply to fate, and they should in no ways be blamed. There were some things which a man's feelings will not allow him to endure after a diet of mangoes and pony. However, we perceived to our amazement that they were not indignant at all. They simply smiled and made a gesture which expressed an habitual pessimism. It was a philosophy which denied the existence of everything but mangoes and pony. It was the Americans who refused to be comforted. I made a deep vow with myself that I would come as soon as possible and play a regular Santa Claus to that splendid escort. But we put to sea in a dugout with two black boys. 
The escort waved us a hearty good bye from the shore, and I never saw them again. I hope they were all on the police force in the new Santiago. In time we were rescued from the dugout by our dispatch boat, and we relieved our feelings by over-rewarding the two black boys. In fact, they reaped a harvest because of our emotions over our failure to fill the gallant stomachs of the escort. They were two rascals. We steamed to the flagship and were given permission to board her. Admiral Sampson is to me the most interesting personality of the war. I would not know how to sketch him for you, even if I could pretend to sufficient material. Anyhow, imagine, first of all, a marble block of impassivity, out of which is carved the figure of an old man. Endow this with life, and you've just begun. Then you must discard all your pictures of bluff, red-faced old gentlemen who roar against the gale, and understand that the quiet old man is a sailor and an admiral. This will be difficult. If I told you he was anything else, it would be easy. He resembles other types. It is his distinction not to resemble the preconceived type of his standing. When I first met him, I was impressed that he was immensely bored by the war and with the command of the North Atlantic Squadron. I perceived a manner where I thought I perceived a mood, a point of view. Later he seemed so indifferent to small things which bore upon large things that I bowed to his apathy as a thing unprecedented, marvelous. Still I mistook a manner for a mood. Still I could not understand that this was the way of the man. I am not to blame, for my communication was slight and depended upon sufferance, upon, in fact, the traditional courtesy of the navy. But finally I saw that it was all manner, that hidden in his indifferent, even apathetic manner, there was the alert, sure, fine mind of the best sea captain that America has produced since... Well, since Farragut. I don't know. I think, well, since Hull. Men follow heartily when they are well led. They balk at trifles when a blockhead cries, Go on. For my part, an impressive thing of the war is the absolute devotion to Admiral Sampson's person. No, to his judgment and wisdom, which was paid by his ship commanders, Evans of the Iowa, Taylor of the Oregon, Higginson of the Massachusetts, Phillips of the Texas, and all the other captains, barring one. Once, afterward, they called upon him to avenge himself upon a rival. They were there, and they would have to say, but he said, no, he guessed it wouldn't do any good to the service. Men feared him, but he never made threats. Men tumbled heels over head to obey him, but he never gave a sharp order. Men loved him, but he said no word, kindly or unkindly. Men cheered for him, and he said, Who are they yelling for? Men behaved badly to him, and he said nothing. Men thought of glory, and he considered the management of ships. All without a sound, a noiseless campaign on his part. No bunting, no arches, no fireworks, nothing but the perfect management of a big fleet. That is a record for you. No trumpets, no cheers of the populace, just plain, pure, unsauced accomplishment. But ultimately he will reap his reward in—in in what? In textbooks on sea campaigns? No more. The people choose their own, and they choose the kind they like. Who has a better right? Anyhow, he is a great man, and when you are once started you can continue to be a great man without the help of bouquets and banquets. He don't need them, bless your heart. The flagship's battle hatches were down, and between decks it was insufferable despite the electric fans. I made my way somewhat forwards past the smart orderly, past the companion, on to the den of the junior mess. Even there they were playing cards in somebody's cabin. "'Hello, old man. Been ashore? How'd it look? It's your deal, chick.' There was nothing but steamy, wet heat, 
and the decent suppression of the consequent ill tempers. The junior officers' quarters were no more comfortable than the admiral's cabin. I had expected it to be so because of my remembrance of their gay spirits. But they were not gay, they were sweltering. Hello, old man, had I been ashore? I fled to the deck, where other officers not on duty were smoking quiet cigars. The hospitality of the officers of the flagship is another charming memory of the war. I rolled into my berth on the dispatch boat that night, feeling a perfect wonder of the day. Was the figure that leaned over the card game on the flagship, the figure with a whiskey and soda in its hand and a cigar in its teeth, was it identical with the figure scrambling, afraid for its life, through Cuban jungle? Was it the figure of the situation of the fifteen pathetic hungry men? It was the same, and it went to sleep, hard sleep. I don't know where we voyaged. I think it was Jamaica, but at any rate, upon the morning of our return to the Cuban coast, we found the sea alive with transports, United States transports from Tampa, containing the Fifth Army Corps under Major General Shafter. The rigging and the decks of these ships were black with men, and everybody wanted to land first. I landed ultimately, and immediately began to look for an acquaintance. The boats were banged by the waves against a little flimsy dock. I fell ashore somehow, but I did not at once find an acquaintance. I talked to a private in the Second Massachusetts Volunteers, who told me that he was going to write war correspondence for a Boston newspaper. This statement did not surprise me. There was a straggly village, but I followed the troops who at this time seemed to be moving out by companies. I found three other correspondents, and it was luncheon time. Somebody had two bottles of bass, but it was so warm that it squirted out in foam. There was no firing, no noise of any kind. An old shed was full of soldiers loafing pleasantly in the shade. It was a hot, dusty, sleepy afternoon. Bees hummed. We saw Major General Lawton standing with his staff under a tree. He was smiling as if he would say, Well, this will be better than chasing Apaches. His division had the advance, and so he had the right to be happy. A tall man with a gray moustache, light but very strong, an ideal cavalryman. He appealed to one all the more because of the vague rumors that his superiors, some of them, were going to take mighty good care that he shouldn't get much to do. It was rather sickening to hear such talk, but later we knew that most of it must have been mere lies. Down by the landing place a band of correspondents were making a sort of permanent camp. They worked like Trojans, carrying wall tents, cots, and boxes of provisions. They asked me to join them, but I looked shrewdly at the sweat on their faces and backed away. The next day the army left this permanent camp eight miles to the rear. The day became tedious. I was glad when evening came. I sat by a campfire and listened to a soldier of the 8th Infantry, who told me that he was the first enlisted man to land. I lay pretending to appreciate him but, in fact, I considered him a great shameless liar. Less than a month ago I learned that every word he said was gospel truth. I was much surprised. We went for breakfast to the camp of the 20th Infantry, where Captain Green and his subaltern, Exton, gave us tomatoes stewed with hard bread and coffee. Later I discovered Green and Exton down at the beach good-naturedly dodging the waves which seemed to be trying to prevent them from washing the breakfast dishes. I felt tremendously ashamed because my cup and my plate were there, you know, and well, fate provides some men greased opportunities for making dizzy jackasses of themselves, and I fell a victim to my flurry on this occasion. I was a blockhead. I walked away blushing. What? The battles? Yes, I saw something of all of them. I made up my mind that the next time I met Green and Exton I'd say, Look here, why didn't you tell me you had to wash your own dishes that morning, so that I could have helped? I felt beastly when I saw you scrubbing there, 
and me walking around idly. But I never saw Captain Green again. I think he is in the Philippines now, fighting the Tagals. The next time I saw Exton, what? Yes, La Guasimas. That was the Rough Rider fight. However, the next time I saw Exton, I... What do you think? I forgot to speak about it. But if ever I meet Green or Exton again, even if it should be twenty years, I am going to say, first thing, why... What? Yes, Roosevelt's regiment and the first and tenth regular cavalry. I'll say, first thing, say, why didn't you tell me you had to wash your own dishes that morning so that I could have helped? My stupidity will be on my conscience until I die, if before that I do not meet either Green or Exton. Oh, yes, you are howling for blood, but I tell you it is more emphatic that I lost my toothbrush. Did I tell you that? Well, I lost it, you see, and I thought of it for ten hours at a stretch. Oh, yes, he? He was shot through the heart. But look here, I contend that the French cable company buncoed us throughout the war. What? Him? My toothbrush I never found, but he died of his wound in time. Most of the regular soldiers carried their toothbrushes stuck in the bands of their hats. It made a quaint military decoration. I have had a line of a thousand men pass me in the jungle, and not a hat lacking the simple emblem. The first of July? All right. My Jamaica polo pony was not present. He was still in the hills to the westward of Santiago, but the Cubans had promised to fetch him to me. But my kit was easy to carry. It had nothing superfluous in it but a pair of spurs which made me indignant every time I looked at them. Oh, I must tell you about a man I met directly after the La Guasimas fight, Edward Marshall, a correspondent whom I had known with a degree of intimacy for seven years, was terribly hit in that fight and asked me if I would not go to Siboney, the base, and convey the news to his colleagues of the New York Journal and round up some assistance. I went to Siboney, and there was not a journal man to be seen, although usually you judged from appearances that the journal staff was about as large as the army. Presently I met two correspondents, strangers to me, but I questioned them, saying that Marshall was badly shot, and wished for such succor as journal men could bring from their dispatch boat. And one of these correspondents replied, He is the man I wanted to describe. I love him as a brother. He said, Marshall? Marshall? Why, Marshall isn't in Cuba at all. He left for New York just before the expedition sailed from Tampa. I said, Beg pardon, but I remarked that Marshall was shot in the fight this morning, and have you seen any journal people? After a pause, he said, I am sure Marshall is not down here at all. He's in New York. I said, Pardon me, but I remarked that Marshall was shot in the fight this morning, and have you seen any journal people? He said, No. Now, look here, you must have gotten two chaps mixed somehow. Marshall isn't in Cuba at all. How could he be shot? I said, Pardon me, but I remarked that Marshall was shot in the fight this morning, and have you seen any journal people? He said, but it can't really be Marshall, you know, for the simple reason that he's not down here. I clasped my hands to my temples, gave one piercing cry to heaven, and fled from his presence. I couldn't go on with him. He excelled me at all points. I have faced death by bullets, fire, water, and disease, but to die thus, to willfully batter myself against the ironclad opinion of this mummy, no, no, not that. In the meantime, it was admitted that a correspondent was shot, be his name Marshall, Bismarck, or Louis the Fourteenth. Now, supposing the name of this wounded correspondent had been Bishop Potter, or Jane Austen, or Bernhardt, or Henri Georges Stephane, Adolf Oper de Blowitz. What effect? Never mind. We will proceed to July 1st. On that morning I marched with my kit, 
having everything essential save a toothbrush, the entire army put me to shame, since there must have been at least fifteen thousand toothbrushes in the invading force. I marched with my kit on the road to Santiago. It was a fine morning, and everybody, the doomed and the immunes, how could we tell one from the other, everybody was in the highest spirits. We were enveloped in forest, but we could hear, from ahead, everybody peppering away at everybody. It was like the roll of many drums. This was Lawton over El Caney. I reflected with complacency that Lawton's division did not concern me in a professional way. That was the affair of another man. My business was with Kent's division and Wheeler's division. We came to El Poso, a hill at nice artillery range from the Spanish defences. Here Grimes's battery was shooting a duel with one of the enemy's batteries. Scoville had established a little camp in the rear of the guns, and a servant had made coffee. I invited Wiggum to have coffee, and the servant added some hard biscuit and tinned tongue. I noted that Wiggum was staring fixedly over my shoulder, and that he waved away the tinned tongue with some bitterness. It was a horse, a dead horse. Then a mule, which had been shot through the nose, wandered up and looked at Wiggum. We ran away. On top of the hill one had a fine view of the Spanish lines. We stared across almost a mile of jungle to ash-colored trenches on the military crest of the ridge. A goodly distance back of this position were white buildings, all flying great red cross flags. The jungle beneath us rattled with firing, and the Spanish trenches crackled out regular volleys, but all this time there was nothing to indicate a tangible enemy. In truth, there was a man in a Panama hat, strolling to and fro behind one of the Spanish trenches, gesticulating at times with a walking stick. A man in a Panama hat, walking with a stick. That was the strangest sight of my life, that symbol, that quaint figure of Mars. The battle, the thunderous row, was his possession. He was the master. He mystified us all with his infernal Panama hat and his wretched walking stick. From near his feet came volleys, and from near his side came roaring shells, but he stood there alone, visible, the one tangible thing. He was a colossus, and he was half as high as a pin, this being. Always somebody would be saying, Who can that fellow be? Later the American guns shelled the trenches and a blockhouse near them, and Mars had vanished. It could not have been death, one cannot kill Mars, but there was one other figure who arose to symbolic dignity. The balloon of our signal corps had swung over the tops of the jungle's trees toward the Spanish trenches, whereat the balloon and the man in the Panama hat and with a walking stick whereat these two waged tremendous battle. Suddenly the conflict became a human thing. A little group of blue figures appeared on the green of the terrible hillside. It was some of our infantry. The attaché of a great empire was at my shoulder, and he turned to me and spoke with incredulity and scorn. Why, they're trying to take the position, he cried, and I admitted meekly that I thought they were. "'But they can't do it, you know,' he protested vehemently. "'It's impossible.' And, good fellow that he was, he began to grieve and wail over a useless sacrifice of gallant men. "'It's plucky, you know. By God it's plucky. But they can't do it.' He was profoundly moved. His voice was quite broken. "'It will simply be a hell of a slaughter, with no good coming out of it.' The trail was already crowded with stretcher-bearers and with wounded men who could walk. One had to stem a tide of mute agony. But I don't know that it was mute agony. I only know that it was mute. It was something in which the silence, or more likely the reticence, was an appalling and inexplicable fact. One's senses seemed to demand that these men should cry out but you could really find wounded men who exhibited all the signs of a pleased and contented mood. 
When thinking of it now, it seems strange beyond words, but at the time, I don't know, it did not attract one's wonder. A man with a hole in his arm or his shoulder, or even in the leg below the knee, was often whimsical, comic. "'Well, this ain't exactly what I enlisted for, boys. If I'd been told about this in Tampa, I'd have resigned from the army. Oh, yes, they can get all the same thing if you keep on going, but I think the Spaniards may run out of ammunition in the course of a week or ten days.' Then, suddenly, one would be confronted by the awful majesty of a man shot in the face. Particularly, I remember one. He had a great dragoon moustache, and the blood streamed down his face to meet his moustache, even as a torrent goes to meet the jammed log, and then swarmed out to the tips and fell in big, slow drops. He looked steadily into my eyes. I was ashamed to return his glance. You understand? It is very curious, all that. The two lines of battle were royally whacking away at each other, and there was no rest or peace in all that region. The modern bullet is a far-flying bird. It rakes the air with its hot-spitting song at distances which, as a usual thing, place the whole landscape in the danger zone. There was no direction from which they did not come. A chart of their courses over one's head would have resembled a spider's web. My friend Jimmy, the photographer, mounted to the firing line with me, and we gallivanted as much as we dared. The sense of the meeting was curious. Most of the men seemed to have no idea of a grand historic performance, but they were grimly satisfied with themselves. Well, be God, we done it. Then they wanted to know about the other parts of the line. How are things looking, old man? Everything all right? Yes, everything's all right, if you can hold this ridge. Ah, hell, said the men, we'll hold the ridge. Don't you worry about that, son. It was Jimmy's first action, and as we cautiously were making our way to the right of our lines, the crash of the Spanish fire became uproarious, and the air simply whistled. I heard a quavering voice near my shoulder, and turning I beheld Jimmy. Jimmy! With a face bloodless, white as paper. He looked at me with eyes opened extremely wide. Say, he said, this is pretty hot, ain't it? I was delighted. I knew exactly what he meant. He wanted to have the situation defined. If I had told him that this was the occasion of some mere idle, desultory fight, and recommended that he wait until the real battle began, I think he would have gone in a bee line for the rear. But I told him the truth. "'Yes, Jimmy,' I replied earnestly, "'you can take it from me that this is patent double extra what for.' And immediately he nodded. "'All right.' If this was a big action, then he was willing to pay in his fright as a rational price for the privilege of being present. But if this was only a penny a fray, he considered the price exorbitant, and he would go away. He accepted my assurance with a simple faith and deported himself with kindly dignity as one moving amid great things. His face was still pale as paper, but that counted for nothing. The main point was his perfect willingness to be frightened for reasons. I wonder where is Jimmy? I lent him the Jamaica polo pony one day, and it ran away with him and flung him off in the middle of a ford. He appeared to me afterward, and made bitter speech concerning this horse, which I had assured him was a gentle and pious animal. Then I never saw Jimmy again. Then came the night of the first of July. A group of correspondents limped back to El Poso. It had been a day so long that the morning seemed as remote as a morning in the previous year. But I have forgotten to tell you about Reuben McNabb. Many years ago I went to school at a place called Claverick in New York State, where there was a semi-military institution. Contemporaneous with me as a student was Reuben McNabb, a long, lank boy, freckled, sandy-haired, an extraordinary boy in no way, and yet, I wager, a boy clearly marked in every recollection. Perhaps there is a good deal in that name, Reuben McNabb. 
You can't fling that name carelessly over your shoulder and lose it. It follows you like the haunting memory of a sin. At any rate, Reuben McNab was identified intimately in my thought with the sunny, irresponsible days at Claverick, when all the earth was a green field and all the sky was a rainless blue. Then I looked down into a miserable huddle at Bloody Bend, a huddle of hurt men, dying men, dead men. And there I saw Reuben McNab, a corporal in the 71st New York Volunteers, and with a hole through his lung, also several holes through his clothing. Well, they got me, he said in greeting. Usually they said that. There were no long speeches. Well, they got me. That was sufficient. The duty of the upright, unhurt man is then difficult. I doubt if many of us learned how to speak to our own wounded. In the first place, one had to play that the wound was nothing, oh, a, a mere nothing, a casual interference with movement, perhaps, but nothing more, oh, really, nothing more. In the second place, one had to show a comrade's appreciation of this sad plight. As a result, I think most of us bungled and stammered in the presence of our wounded friends. That's curious, huh? Well, they got me, said Reuben McNab. I had looked upon five hundred wounded men with stolidity, or with a conscious indifference which filled me with amazement. But the apparition of Reuben McNab, the schoolmate, lying there in the mud, with a hole through his lung, awed me into stutterings, set me trembling with a sense of terrible intimacy with this war, which heretofore I could have believed was a dream. Almost. Twenty shot men rolled their eyes and looked at me. Only one man paid no heed. He was dying. He had no time. The bullets hummed low over them all. Death, having already struck, still insisted upon raising a venomous crest. "'If you're going by the hospital, step in and see me,' said Reuben McNab. That was all. At the correspondence camp at El Pozo there was hot coffee. It was very good. I have a vague sense of being very selfish over my blanket and rubber coat. I have a vague sense of spasmodic firing during my sleep. It rained, and then I awoke to hear that steady drumming of an infantry fire, something which was never to cease, it seemed. They were at it again. The trail from El Pozo to the positions along San Juan Ridge had become an exciting thoroughfare. Shots from large-bore rifles dropped in from almost every side. At this time the safest place was the extreme front. I remember in particular the one outcry I heard. A private in the 71st, without his rifle, had gone to a stream for some water and was returning, being but a little in rear of me. Suddenly I heard this cry, Oh, my God, come quick! And I was conscious then to having heard the hateful zip of a close shot. He lay on the ground, wriggling. He was hit in the hip. Two men came quickly. Presently everybody seemed to be getting knocked down. They went over like men of wet felt, quietly, calmly, with no more complaint than so many automatons. It was only that lad, oh my God, come quick! Otherwise men seemed to consider that their hurts were not worthy of particular attention. A number of people got killed very courteously, tacitly absolving the rest of us from any care in the matter. A man fell. He turned blue. His face took on an expression of deep sorrow, and then his immediate friends worried about him, if he had friends. This was July 1. I crave the permission to leap back again to that date. On the morning of July 2, I sat on San Juan Hill and watched Lawton's division come up. I was absolutely sheltered, but still where I could look into the faces of men who were trotting up under fire. There wasn't a high heroic face among them. They were all men intent on business. That was all. It may seem to you that I am trying to make everything a squalor. That would be wrong. I feel that things were often sublime, 
but they were differently sublime. They were not of our shallow and preposterous fictions. They stood out in a simple, majestic commonplace. It was the behavior of men on the street. It was the behavior of men. In a way, each man was just pegging along at the heels of the man before him, who was pegging along at the heels of still another man, who was pegging along at the heels of still another man who... It was that in the flat and obvious way. In another way, it was pageantry, the pageantry of the accomplishment of naked duty. One cannot speak of it, the spectacle of the common man serenely doing his work, his appointed work. It is the one thing in the universe which makes one fling expression to the winds and be satisfied to simply feel. Thus they moved at San Juan, the soldiers of the United States regular army. One pays them the tribute of the toast of silence. Lying near one of the enemy's trenches was a red-headed Spanish corpse. I wonder how many hundreds were cognizant of this red-headed Spanish corpse. It arose to the dignity of a landmark. There were many corpses, but only one with a red head. This red head. He was always there. Each time I approached that part of the field, I prayed that I might find that he had been buried. But he was always there, red-headed. His strong, simple countenance was a malignant sneer at the system which was forever killing the credulous peasants in a sort of black night of politics, where the peasants merely followed whatever somebody had told them was lofty and good. But nevertheless, the red-headed Spaniard was dead. He was irrevocably dead. And to what purpose? The honor of Spain? Surely the honor of Spain could have existed without the violent death of this poor red-headed peasant. Ah, well, he was buried when the heavy firing ceased and men had time for such small things as funerals. The trench was turned over on top of him. It was a fine, honorable, soldierly fate to be buried in a trench, the trench of the fight and the death. Sleep well, red-headed peasant. You came to another hemisphere to fight because, because you were told to, I suppose. Well, there you are, buried in your trench on San Juan Hill. That is the end of it. Your life has been taken. That is a flat, frank fact and foreigners buried you expeditiously while speaking a strange tongue. Sleep well, red-headed mystery. End of section 16